Today's species spotlight is on one of the coolest species of colubrids out there. Today we're talking about the largest species of milk snake, and that is the black milk snake. Now, the black milk snake, along with most other kings and milk snakes, belong to the genus Lampropeltis. Lampropeltis has roughly 25 to 28 different subspecies that, depending on who you want to argue with, all make up a range between North America down to Central America and into South America. The black milk snake subspecies comes from Central America, primarily in the countries of Panama and Costa Rica. Now these guys are a little bit unique where it comes to where they live, because even though there are other Central American milk snakes out there, the black milk snakes usually live in high elevation cloud forests in Central America. And what that basically means is that high elevation, we're talking 4,000 to 7,000 plus feet up in elevation. So that's above sea level. So here in Colorado, where I'm currently sitting, it's at about 7,800-ish feet above sea level. And obviously Denver being mile high, 50 to 80, blah, 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 blah. They do pretty well at this high elevation. The other which was that cloud forest that I was talking about. What that basically means is that low hanging clouds will often blanket the ground for extended periods of time, giving them a very cool, humid, almost hazy, foggy habitat, which is much longer and sustained than say like, you know, it's a cooler morning and there's fog on your way to work or to school, right? Now, that is a really, really interesting thing about these guys, and we'll come back to that later down in the video. When you first look at the black milk snake, and I apologize that I don't have any in front of me, because as always, whenever I'm recording something, something is always off about it. And so both of mine happen to be in shed right now, so shadaisy. So that's why you won't see one in my hands for the whole video, obviously. Now, when you very first look at the black milk snakes, the two things that strike out at you first are number one, the size, and number two, the color. Let's talk about the size first. Now, these guys, as I said previously, are the largest subspecies of the milk snakes. They average four to five-ish feet in length. However, they very often can achieve lengths of six feet. And there are very, very, very not really credible reports, but quite a few of them reports of hitting lengths of around seven feet, which is huge. I've never seen one like that. However, I haven't seen too, too many of adults outside the range of about five and a half feet long, so not gonna deny anybody's reports. Now, with that in mind, there are other milk snake subspecies that do get to those incredibly long lengths. Even a king snake species like this, some of the Easterns or the Florida king snakes or the Brooks or whatever, whatever we're gonna classify it now, but like, the Honduran milk snakes, the Ecuadorian milk snakes, the Andean milk snakes, those can also achieve those very long lengths. But the black milks on average are a little bit heavier and a little bit longer just in general. So they get the belt. Now, the second thing, the namesake, black. That is what these guys are known for. Now, as I said at the beginning, they belong to the genus Lampropeltis. Lampropeltis, roughly translated from Latin, means shield belly. And that alludes to the incredibly high iridescence or the shine of their belly scales. And obviously there's a large amount of iridescence on the rest of their bodies as well. And they do absolutely have that. They, for a long time, were called the poor man's indigo. Well before the vogue rise in popularity of the Mexican black king snakes, which are obviously a much more slender body and a much smaller species of snake. These guys are beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. However, if you've ever seen a juvenile black snake, uh -huh, if you've ever seen a juvenile black milk snake, you wouldn't believe that that's what it is because that's the really cool and interesting and almost mystifying thing about the black milk snakes is that they go through an autogenetic change just the same way that say an emerald tree boa or a green tree python does only it's a little bit different. It's very similar to that of the now very popular IMG boas. When black milk snakes first hatch out, they pop out, albeit a little bit larger than most other milk snake and king snake subspecies. They come out the very iconic, very first thing to think of, red, black, and then yellow to yellow white-ish color tri-striped snake. They look like pretty much all of the other ones. And then as they get older with each shed and just as they continue to grow and age out in general they get darker and darker and darker until eventually you get these animals that can be solid black although oftentimes you can still see a little bit of kind of 
faded pattern into their bodies if you look really closely or if you have really nice light out there. And that's the cool thing about these black milk snakes is that you can get this little cute little animal that looks like the regular tricolor milk snakes, although I do like the tricolors myself as well, and then it turns into this solid jet black, very dark, long animal. Super, super cool. Now in the wild, we don't know too, too much about every single detail of their behavior. However, as a milk snake, king snake, again, whoever you want to argue with, they are usually considered generalists and they are known to predate birds, reptiles, mammals, even other snakes, including vipers, other milk snakes, and so on and so forth. So as captives, what that generally means is that they make for a very good, well-fed animal. And that is primarily the case with most species of the kings and milks, is that they are very good feeders. In captivity, they obviously, milk snakes, in addition to all the really weird, dumb cow farmer stuff, they are known to musk as a defensive mechanism. So the big predators, the Godzilla monsters that we people are, when we go to grab our little pet snake, they will often musk. And as a last resort, they will even use the only other weapon they have in the arsenal, their face. However, the black milk snakes are typically one that is much more reluctant to bite or to musk. And in fact, young ones seem to be very fidgety or flighty, almost like little garter snakes or house snakes that they really don't want to be handled with again, but they are very reluctant to bite or to musk. And as you age out with them, as you learn to work with them, they will eventually learn to trust that we're not going to eat them. And then you have a really nice, very calm, great captive pet snake. Now, again, we're talking about captivity and we're gonna go talk back all the way back to the beginning of the video where we talked about their habitats. Because of the montane regions where they live, their actual husbandry is a little bit different than most of the other popular species of snakes we keep, including other milks and kings and corns and all those. But as it turns out, it actually makes it a little bit easier for us for the most part. So remember we talked about the montane cloud forest, so that very cool, humid areas. What that means is that these guys actually prefer and do much better in cooler temperatures with a basking temperature in the very low 80s, up to about 85 or so is usually where multiple people usually say that's where their hottest part of their black milk snake enclosure is. So that means room temps are absolutely perfect for these guys, very similar to that of like, say the Cresta geckos. For Cresta geckos, room temp, perfect. It's of the best. Super easy, you don't need a whole bunch of electricity and a whole bunch of heat lamps and stuff plugged in for them. And again, because they prefer cooler temperatures, they can actually handle very steep night drops into even the 60s and high 50s. While that isn't necessarily recommended all of the time, it is a really good thing, especially in an area with colder winters. If you, you know, the way the world is right now, if you're having money issues with having high heat bills and stuff, you don't have to have a really, you don't have to have your heat cranked up to 80 if you have a bunch of black milk snakes. So really cool there. Then with the whole humid thing, they do need more ambient humidity than say like a Puebloan or a Nelson's milk snake. But if you just keep on cocoa block or cypress mulch, like you would like a ball python or other tropical species of snake or lizard or tortoise or reptile of any sort, then that usually does pretty well. And in fact, my guys are on coconut bedding right now. I rarely even sit there and dump their water into their thing. I usually just straight change it, unlike I do with some of my other higher humidity needs reptiles, and they shed perfectly every single time. So very easy to keep. Every source that I went to when I was looking at their care requirements as adults has a very similar thing that you see with a lot of this stuff. It's the copy and paste Wikipedia article over and over again, which a lot of them say that these guys don't move around a whole lot and they actually need, they don't need a very large enclosure. You can keep a six foot animal in something like a 40 gallon tank. Here's the part where I disagree. While it is probably true that a montane cooler weather subspecies of milk snake like the black milk probably doesn't move around a whole lot because that's actually been documented in other species of high elevation cooler weather reptiles where a lot of times they have a very small home range and they will usually kind of go into the same pattern. They go out, they'll find a basking spot and they'll go back in until the day is a little bit warmer or until the evening when it's just kind of cooling down and they'll do their kind of thing, but they're not out very often and they stay in their very small range. A very, very high profile example of that is the Bolands Python in parts of Indonesia. 
that's something that they definitely witnessed, where a lot of the female Boland's pythons would actually come out onto their rocks or onto their basking logs, and they would be there for a while while they bask in the morning, and then they would go back and not be seen for sometimes even days. And that is probably something that a lot of experts think that the black milk snake is doing. And so they say it's a very sedentary subspecies, and it just kind of sits there. I tend to somewhat disagree, mostly because there is still a fair amount of temperature gradients we can't quite nail in in something that's only three feet long by 18 inches wide. So I think that as an adult black milk snake, you should try to go a little bit bigger. Again, you don't need the incredibly large high basking spots that you say would need for like a ball python or a boa or God forbid a bearded dragon or even a woma python. So easy room temperatures, cocoa husk bedding and unless you live in an area that's very dry you may not even really need a humid hide with the a bed added benefit of cypress mulch although it's never a bad thing to have a little bit extra spot for them to if they want to choose to have that as well these guys are an amazing beautiful species of snake their price has fluctuated a lot over the past 10 plus years or so remember when i called them the poor man's indigo that's true, where the Eastern Indigos, the Texas Indigos, the Mexican Indigos, those all go for over $1,000 each, and that's kind of historically what their price point has been. The black milk snakes prices have fluctuated from over 500 to out of the egg baby to right now they can probably be picked up from a wholesaler for less than 100 Right now, I think if you were to go down to a pet store or go on to Morph Market, you'd probably find them around 200 ish dollars. So it's a fairly affordable, and I know 200 is a big price point for a lot of people, but when compared to like $4,000 ball pythons, uh, it's a fairly affordable, relatively easy to handle animal that even though it has a decent length to it, they're not a very heavy bodied snake. So it makes good handleable pet, especially with one that you get as a hatchling as you raise up. It gets more comfortable you so it's not super flighty it's kind of like a really nice big black corn snake almost as far as personality goes for some of the adults that go there i know some people can get turned off by it. it's like i've got it because it's so bright and colorful and then it just turns black but that's kind of a lot of the appeal for these guys as well so let me know about your guys' opinions on the black milk snakes i've kind of heard a little bit of everything but i'm always welcome to hear what you guys think about these guys if you think they're really cool my pair have another couple years to grow the black milk snake as a whole is a fairly slow growing colubrid to where typically they're not breeding until their fourth fifth sometimes even sixth year unlike with corn snakes there's this thing with breeding called the rule of three which is three years 300 grams three feet these guys it's a little bit longer because they're a little bit slower growing probably due to the fact of the climates that where they originate from cooler temperatures, less periods of activity, or shorter periods of activity, I should say, which doesn't allow for rapid growth very quickly. So hopefully you guys enjoyed today's video. I always love talking about these really cool species of colubrids. Hopefully I'll have more regular scheduled reptile content. In the meantime, I hope you guys are also enjoying my little fun series, little fun series, it's been a long day, I apologize, of introducing all of my other species of snakes. And then again, because I haven't mentioned it for the past couple, if what we're trying to do is eventually hit 10,000 subscribers at 5,000, which we're getting pretty close, we're going to do a full property tour. We're going to show, I don't know if I'm going to sit there and go tub to tub to tub, hence the point of the series of all the different individual animals, but I'll show you this entire building that I'm in, including the cool weather room. Then you show you outside. So as you've seen in a lot of my posts lately, I've been talking about the puppies and the livestock and everything like that. You'll get to see all of them, the pond, the whole property tour. So share, subscribe, please, please, please. And then at 10,000, we're going to do an animal giveaway. So just as a reminder for everybody else, again, hope you enjoyed today's video. Thank you all so much. If you want to check out more of this content, you can check out the playlist of subs. Uh, ugh, you can check out the species spotlight playlist right here. I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to take a break after this. Uh, that you can check this out. There's over 60 different species in there starting to re back and re go back and visit, see? some of the previous ones that I did three years ago because I'm getting a little bit better this part notwithstanding but presenting some very nice clear and consistent information for you guys so again hope you enjoyed the video hope you're having a great day and we'll check you next time